Chapter Thirteen of the Wolf Hunters. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Christina Glavis. The Wolf Hunters by James Oliver Curwood. Chapter Thirteen. Snowed in. Until the present moment, Rod had forgotten to speak of the mysterious man-trail he had encountered in the chasm. The excitement of the past hour had made him oblivious to all other things, but now as they ate their dinner he described the strange maneuvers of the spying Munga. He did not, however, voice those fears which had come to him in the gorge, preferring to allow Mukoki and Wabigawan to draw their own conclusions. By this time the two Indians were satisfied that the Woongas were not contemplating attack, but that for some unaccountable reason they were as anxious to evade the hunters as the hunters were to evade them. Everything that had passed seemed to give evidence of this. The outlaw in the chasm, for instance, could easily have waylaid Rod. A dozen times the almost defenseless camp could have been attacked, and there were innumerable places where ambushes might have been laid for them along the trap lines. So Rod's experience with the Woonga Trail between the mountains occasioned little uneasiness, and instead of forming a scheme for the further investigation of this trail on the south, plans were made for locating the first fall. Mukoki was the swiftest and most tireless traveler on snowshoes, and it was he who volunteered to make the first search. He would leave the following morning, taking with him a supply of food, and during his absence Rod and Wabigawan would attend to the traps. "'We must have the location of the first fall before we return to the post,' declared Wabi. "'If from that we find that the third fall is not within a hundred miles of our present camp, it will be impossible for us to go in search of our gold during this trip.' In that event we shall have to go back to Wabinosh House and form a new expedition, with fresh supplies and the proper kind of tools. We cannot do anything until the spring freshets are over, anyway. I have been thinking of that, replied Rod, his eyes softening. You know, Mother is alone, and her— I understand, interrupted the Indian boy, laying a hand fondly across his companion's arm. Her funds are small, you know, Rod finished. If she has been sick, or anything like that, yes, we've got to get back with our furs, helped Wabi, a tremor of tenderness in his own voice. And if you don't mind, Rod, I might take a little run down to Detroit with you. Do you suppose she would care? Care? shouted Rod, bringing his free hand down upon Wabi's arm with a force that hurt. Care? Why, she thinks as much of you as she does of me, Wabi. She'd be tickled to death. Do you mean it? Wabi's bronze face flushed a deeper red at his friend's enthusiasm. I won't promise, for sure, he said. But I'd like to see her. Almost as much as you, I guess. If I can, I'll go. Rod's face was suffused with a joyful glow. "'And I'll come back with you early in the summer, and we'll start out for the gold!' he cried. He jumped to his feet and slapped Mukoki on the back in the happy turn his mind had taken. "'Will you come too, Mukoki? I'll give you the biggest city time you ever had in your life!' The old Indian grinned and chuckled and grunted, but did not reply in words. Wabi laughed and answered for him. "'He is too anxious to become Minnetaki's slave again, Rod.' No, Muki won't go, I'll wager that. He will stay at the post to see that she doesn't get lost or hurt or stolen by the Woongas. Eh, Mukoki? Mukoki nodded, grinning good-humoredly. He went to the door, opened it, and looked out. Devil, she snow, he cried. She snow like twenty thousand, like devil. This was the strongest English in the old warrior's vocabulary, and it meant something more than usual. Wabi and Rod quickly joined him. Never in his life had the city youth seen a snowstorm like which he now gazed out into. The great north storm had arrived. 
a storm which comes just once each year in the endless arctic desolation for days and weeks the indians had expected it and wondered at its lateness it fell softly silently without a breath of air to stir it a smothering voiceless sea of white impenetrable to human vision so thick that it seemed as though it might stifle one's breath rod held out the palm of his hand and in an instant it was covered with a film of white he walked out into it and a dozen yards away he became a ghostly almost invisible shadow when he came back a minute later he brought a load of snow into the cabin with him all that afternoon the snow fell like this and all that night the storm continued when he awoke in the morning rod heard the wind whistling and howling through the trees and around the ends of the cabin he rose and built the fire while the others were still sleeping he attempted to open the door but it was blocked he lowered the barricade at the window and a barrel of snow tumbled in about his feet he could see no sign of day and when he turned he saw wabi sitting up in his blankets laughing silently at his wonder and consternation what in the world he gasped we're snowed in grinned wabi does the stove smoke no replied rod throwing a bewildered glance at the roaring fire you don't mean to say then we are not completely buried interrupted the other at least the top of the chimney is sticking out mukoki sat up and stretched himself she blow he said as a tremendous howl of wind swept over the cabin by and by she blow some more rod shoveled the snow into a corner and replaced the barricade while his companions dressed this means a week's work digging out traps declared wabi and only mukoki's great spirit who sends all blessings to this country knows when the blizzard is going to stop it may last a week there is no chance of finding our waterfall in this we can play dominoes suggested rod cheerfully you remember we haven't finished that series we began at the post but you don't expect me to believe that it snowed enough yesterday afternoon and last night to cover this cabin do you it didn't exactly snow enough to cover it explained his comrade but we're covered for all of that the cabin is on the edge of an open and of course the snow just naturally drifts around us blown there by the wind if this blizzard keeps up we shall be under a small mountain by night won't it smother us faltered rod Wabi gave a joyous whoop of merriment at the city-bred youth's half-expressed fear, and a volley of Mukoki's chuckles came from where he was slicing moose steak on the table. Snow, mighty nice thing live under, he asserted with emphasis. If you were under a mountain of snow, you could live, if you weren't crushed to death, said Wabi. Snow is filled with air. Mukoki was caught under a snowslide once and was buried under thirty feet for ten hours. He had made a nest about as big as a barrel and was nice and comfortable when we dug him out. We won't have to burn much wood to keep warm now. After breakfast, the boys again lowered the barricade at the window, and Wabi began to bring small avalanches of snow down into the cabin with his shovel. At the third or fourth upward thrust, a huge mass plunged through the window, burying them to the waist, and when they looked out they could see the light of day and the whirling blizzard above their heads. "'It's up to the roof!' gasped Rod. "'Great Scott, what a snowstorm!' "'Now for some fun!' cried the Indian youth. "'Come on, Rod, if you want to be in it!' He crawled through the window into the cavity he had made in the drift and Rod followed. Wabi waited, a mischievous smile on his face, and no sooner had his companion joined him than he plunged his shovel deep into the base of the drift. Half a dozen quick thrusts, and there tumbled down upon their heads a mass of light snow that for a few moments completely buried them. The suddenness of it knocked Rod to his knees, where he floundered, gasped, and made a vain effort to yell struggling like a fish he first kicked his feet free and wabi who had thrust out his head and shoulders shrieked with laughter as he saw only rod's boots 
sticking out of the snow. You're going the wrong way, Rod, he shouted. Wow, wow! He seized his companion's legs and helped to drag him out, and then stood shaking, the tears streaming down his face, and continued to laugh until he leaned back in the drift, half exhausted. Rod was a curious and ludicrous-looking object. His eyes were wide and blinking. The snow was in his ears, his mouth, and in his floundering he had packed his coat collar full of it. Slowly he recovered from his astonishment, saw Wabi and Mukoki quivering with laughter, grinned, and then joined them in their merriment. It was not difficult now for the boys to force their way through the drift, and they were soon standing waist-deep in the snow, twenty yards from the cabin. "'The snow is only about four feet deep in the open,' said Wabi. "'But look at that!' He turned and gazed at the cabin, or rather at the small part of it which still rose triumphant above the huge drift which had almost completely buried it. Only a little of the roof, with the smoking chimney rising out of it, was to be seen. Rod now turned in all directions to survey the wild scene about him. There had come a brief lull in the blizzard, and his vision extended beyond the lake and to the hilltop. There was not a spot of black to meet his eyes. Every rock was hidden. The trees hung silent and lifeless under their heavy mantles, and even their trunks were beaten white with the clinging volleys of the storm. There came to him then a thought of the wild things in this seemingly uninhabitable desolation. How could they live in this endless desert of snow? What could they find to eat? Where could they find water to drink? He asked Wabi these questions after they had returned to the cabin. Just now, if you traveled from here to the end of this storm zone, you wouldn't find a living four-legged creature, said Wabigawan. Every moose in this country, every deer and caribou, every fox and wolf is buried in the snow. And as the snow falls deeper about them, the warmer and more comfortable do they become, so that even as the blizzard increases in fury, the kind creator makes it easier for them to bear. When the storm ceases, the wilderness will awaken into life again. The moose and deer and caribou will rise from their snow beds and begin to eat the boughs of trees and saplings. A crust will have formed on the snow, and all the smaller animals, like foxes, lynx, and wolves, will begin to travel again and to prey upon others for food. Until they find running water, again snow and ice take the place of liquid drink. Warm caverns dug in the snow give refuge in place of thick swamp moss and brush and leaves. All the big animals, like moose, deer, and caribou, will soon make yards for themselves by trampling down large areas of snow, and in these yards they will gather in big herds, eating their way through the forest, fighting the wolves, and waiting for spring. Oh, life isn't altogether bad for the animals in a deep winter like this. Until noon the hunters were busy cleaning away the snow from the cabin door. As the day advanced, the blizzard increased in its fury, until, with the approach of night, it became impossible for the hunters to expose themselves to it. For three days the storm continued with only intermittent lulls, but with the dawn of the fourth day the sky was again cloudless, and the sun rose with a blinding effulgence. Rod now found himself suffering from that sure affliction of every tenderfoot in the far north, snow blindness. For only a few minutes at a time could he stand the dazzling reflections of the snow waste where nothing but white, flashing, scintillating white, seemingly a vast sea of burning electric points in the sunlight, met his aching eyes. On the second day after the storm, while Wabi was still inuring Rod to the changed world and teaching him how to accustom his eyes to it gradually, Mukoki left the cabin to follow the chasm in his search for the first waterfall. That same day Wabi began his work of digging out and resetting the traps, but it was not until the day following that Rod's eyes would allow him to assist. The task was a most difficult one. Rocks and other landmarks were completely hidden, and the lost traps averaged one out of four. 
it was not until the end of the second day after mukoki's departure that the young hunters finished the mountain trap line and when they turned their faces toward camp just at the beginning of dusk it was with the expectant hope that they would find the old indian awaiting them but mukoki had not returned the next day came and passed and a fourth dawned without his arrival hope now gave way to fear in three days mukoki could travel nearly a hundred miles was it possible that something had happened to him many times there recurred to rod a thought of the woonga in the chasm had the mysterious spy or some of his people waylaid and killed him neither of the hunters had a desire to leave camp during the fourth day trapping was exceptionally good now on account of the scarcity of animal food and since the big storm they had captured a wolf two lynx a red fox and eight mink but as mukoki's absence lengthened their enthusiasm grew less in the afternoon as they were watching they saw a figure climb warily to the summit of the hill it was mukoki with shouts of greeting both youths hurried through the snow toward him not taking time to strap on their snowshoes the old indian was at their side a couple of minutes later he smiled in a tired good-natured way and answered the eagerness in their eyes with a nod of his head found fall fifth mile down mountain once in the cabin he dropped into a chair exhausted and both rod and wabigwan joined in relieving him of his boots and outer garments it was evident that mukoki had been traveling hard for only once or twice before in his life had wabi seen him so completely fatigued quickly the young indian had a huge steak broiling over the fire and rod put an extra handful of coffee in the pot fifty miles ejaculated wabi for the twentieth time it was an awful jaunt wasn't it muki rough rough like devil through mountains replied mukoki not like that he swung an arm in the direction of the chasm rod stood silent open-eyed with wonder was it possible that the old warrior had discovered a wilder country than that through which he had passed in the chasm she little fall went on mukoki brightening as the odor of coffee and meat filled his nostrils no bigger than that he pointed to the roof of the cabin rod was figuring on the table soon he looked up according to mukoki in the map we are at least two hundred and fifty miles from the third fall he said mukoki shrugged his shoulders and his face was crinkled in a suggestive grimace hudson bay he grunted wabi turned from his stake in sudden astonishment doesn't the chasm continue east he almost shouted no she turn straight north rod could not understand the change that came over wabi's face boys he said finally if that is the case i can tell you where the gold is if the stream in the chasm turns northward it is bound for just one place the albany river and the albany river empties into james bay the third waterfall where our treasure and gold is waiting for us is in the very heart of the wildest and most savage wilderness in north america it is safe no other man has ever found it but to get it means one of the longest and most adventurous expeditions we ever planned in all our lives hurrah shouted rod hurrah he had leaped to his feet forgetful of everything but that their gold was safe and that their search for it would lead them even to the last fastnesses of the snow-bound and romantic north next spring wabi he held out his hand and the two boys joined their pledge in a hearty grip next spring reiterated wabi and we go in canoe joined mukoki creek grow bigger we make birch bark canoe at first fall that is better still added wabi it will be a glorious trip we'll take a little vacation at the third fall and run up to james bay james bay is practically the same as hudson bay isn't it asked rod yes i could never see a good reason for calling it james bay 
it is in reality the lower end or tail of hudson bay there was no thought of visiting any of the traps that day and the next morning mukoki insisted upon going with rod in spite of his four days of hard travel if he remained in camp his joints would get stiff he said and wabigwan thought he was right this left the young indian to care for the trap line leading into the north two weeks of ideal trapping weather now followed it had been more than two months since the hunters had left wabinosh house and rod now began to count the days before they would turn back over the homeward trail wabi had estimated that they had sixteen hundred dollars worth of furs and scalps and two hundred dollars in gold and the white youth was satisfied to return to his mother with his share of six hundred dollars which was as much as he would have earned in a year at his old position in the city neither did he attempt to conceal from wabi his desire to see minnetaki and his indian friend thoroughly pleased at rod's liking for his sister took much pleasure in frequent good-natured banter on the subject in fact rod possessed a secret hope that he might induce the princess mother to allow her daughter to accompany himself and wabi to detroit where he knew that his own mother would immediately fall in love with the beautiful little maiden from the north in the third week after the great storm rod and mukoki had gone over the mountain trap line leaving wabi in camp they had decided that the following week would see them headed for wabinosh house where they would arrive about the first of february and roderick was in high spirits on this day they had started toward camp early in the afternoon and soon after they had passed through the swamp rod expressed his intention of ascending the ridge hoping to get a shot at game somewhere along the mountain trail home mukoki however decided not to accompany him but to take the nearer and easier route on the top of the mountain rod paused to take a survey of the country about him he could see mukoki now hardly more than a moving speck on the edge of the plain northward the same fascinating never-ending wilderness rolled away under his eyes eastward two miles away he saw a moving object which he knew was a moose or a caribou and westward instinctively his eyes sought the location of their camp instantly the expectant light went out of his face he gave an involuntary cry of horror and there followed a single unheard shriek from mukoki over the spot where he knew their camp to be now rose a huge volume of smoke the sky was black with it and in the terrible moment that followed his piercing cry for mukoki he fancied that he heard the sound of rifle shots mukoki mukoki he shouted the old indian was beyond hearing quickly it occurred to rod that early in their trip they had arranged rifle signals for calling help two quick shots and then after a moment's interval three others in rapid succession he threw his rifle to his shoulder and fired into the air once twice and then three times as fast as he could press the trigger as he watched mukoki he reloaded he saw the indian pause turn about and look back toward the mountain again the thrilling signals for help went echoing over the plain in a few seconds the sounds had reached mukoki's ears and the old warrior came swinging back at running speed rod darted along the ridge to meet him firing a single shot now and then to let him know where he was and in fifteen minutes mukoki came panting up the mountain the woongas shouted rod they've attacked the camp see he pointed to the cloud of smoke i heard shots i heard shots for an instant the grim pathfinder gazed in the direction of the burning camp, and then without a word he started at terrific speed down the mountain. The half-hour race that followed was one of the most exciting experiences of Rod's life. How he kept up with Mukoki was more than he ever could explain afterward, but from the time they struck the old trail he was close at the Indian's heels. When they reached the hill that sheltered the dip, his face was scratched and bleeding from contact with swinging bushes. His heart seemed ready to burst from its tremendous exertion. His breath came in an audible hissing, rattling sound, and he could not speak. 
but up the hill he plunged behind Mukoki, his rifle cocked and ready. At the top they paused. The camp was a smoldering mass of ruins. Not a sign of life was about it, but... With a gasping, wordless cry, Rod caught Mukoki's arm and pointed to an object lying in the snow a dozen yards from where the cabin had been. The warrior had seen it. He turned one look upon the white youth, and it was a look that Rod had never thought could come into the face of a human being. If that was Wabi down there, if Wabi had been killed, what would Mukoki's vengeance be? His companion was no longer Mukoki, as he had known him. He was the savage. There was no mercy, no human instinct, no suggestion of the human soul in that one terrible look. If that was Wabi. They plunged down the hill, into the dip, across the lake, and Mukoki was on his knees beside the figure in the snow. He turned it over and rose without a sound, his battle-glaring eyes peering into the smoking ruins. Rod looked and shuddered. The figure in the snow was not Wabi. It was a strange, terrible-looking object, a giant Indian, distorted in death, and a half of his head was shot away. When he again looked at Mukoki, the old Indian was in the midst of the hot ruins, kicking about with his booted feet and poking with the butt of his rifle. End of chapter 13 Recording by Christina Glavis